From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. The external storage array business as we know it has changed forever. You know, you can see that in the survey data that we do and the financial information from the largest public storage companies. And it's not just because of COVID, although that's clearly a factor, which has accelerated the shifts that we see in the market. Specifically though, CIOs are rationalizing their infrastructure portfolios by consolidating workloads to simplify, reduce costs and minimize vendor sprawl so they can shift resources toward digital initiatives that include cloud, containers, machine intelligence and automation, all while reducing their risks. Hello everyone, this is Dave Vellante and welcome to this CUBE conversation where we're going to discuss strategies related to workload consolidation at petabyte scale. And with me is Dr. Rico, he's the vice president, office of the CTO at Infinidat. Welcome back to the CUBE doc, always a pleasure to see you. And great to be here, always a pleasure to work with you, Dave. So doc, I just published a piece over the weekend and I pointed out that of the largest storage companies, only one showed revenue growth last quarter. And that was on a significantly reduced compare with last year. So my first question to you is, is Infinidat growing its business? Oh, absolutely. It, it's been a very interesting year all across, as you can quite imagine. Um, but, you know, our footprint is such that with our elastic pricing models and the, and the fact that we've got excess capacity uh, in almost every single system that's out there, we were really giving our customers a, an, an opportunity to take advantage of that to increase their capacity levels while maintaining the same levels of performance and availability, but not have to have anybody on premises during this crazy, you know, COVID struck era. Yeah, so you're bringing that cloud model to the, to the data center, which has obviously been a challenge. I mean, you mentioned the, the subscription sort of like pricing. We're going to get into the cloud more, but I wonder if we could step back a little bit and look at some of the macro trends that you're seeing in the market and specifically as it relates to on-prem storage strategies that CIOs are taking. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting. We've seen over the course of the past five years or so, certainly a big uptick in people looking at next generation or what they believe and perceive to be next generation storage platforms, which are really just evolutions of media. They're not really taking advantage of any new innovations in storage and, you know, notwithstanding our own products, which are all software driven. We've talked about that before, but what what's really happened in this past year, as you, as you said, CIOs and CTOs, they're always looking for that, that next point of leverage and advantage. And they're looking for more agility in application deployment. They're looking in uh, a way to rapidly respond to business requirements. So they're looking very much at those cloud-like requirements. They're looking at those capabilities to containerize applications. They're looking at how they can uh, you know, shift out virtual machines if they're not in a, directly in a container uh, and how the storage, by the way, can, can have the same advantage. And, and in order to do so, they really need to look at storage consolidation. You know, I, I think Dave, to, to sum it up from the storage perspective, you know, I love Ken Steinhardt was recently on, on a video and, you know, he was, he was challenged that, you know, people aren't looking at, at spinning rust or, you know, a derogatory way of referring to disks. And, and Ken so rightly and, and accurately responded, yeah, but people aren't really looking for QLC either. You know, what they're looking for is performance scale availability and certainly cost effectiveness and price. Yeah, it's like I said up front, Doc. I mean, if, if you're a C-level executive today, you don't want to worry about your storage infrastructure. You got bigger problems to worry about. You just want it to work. And so when you talk about consolidating workloads, people often talk about the so-called blast radius. In other words, people who run data centers, they understand that things fail. And sometimes yep. something as simple, it might be a power supply can have a catastrophic downstream effect on application availability. So my question is, how do you think about architecting systems so as to minimize the effects of component failures on the business? Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting term, Dave, blast radius, right? We've, we've heard this referred to storage over the last 
several decades, in fact, when it really should refer to the data center and the application infrastructure. Uh, but, you know, if we're talking about just the storage footprint itself, one of the things that we really need to look look at is the resilience and the reliability of the architecture. And when you look at something that is maybe dual controller, single or double power supply, there are issues and concerns to take in, in, into into play. And what we've done is we've designed something that's really triple redundant, which has typically only been applied to the very high end of the market before. And we do it in a very active, active, active manner. And naturally we have suggestions for best practices for deployment within a data center as well. You know, multiple sources of power coming into the array and things of that nature. But everything needs to be this active, active, active type of architecture in order to bring those reliability levels up to the point where as long as it's a, a component failure within the array, it's not going to cause an outage or data unavailability event. Yeah, so imagine a, a heat map. I mean, people talk about the blast radius. So imagine a heat map is green. There's a big, you know, there's a yellow area and there's a, there's a red area. And what you're saying is as far as the array goes, you're essentially eliminating the red area. Now, if you take it to the broader installation, you know, that red area, you, you have to deal with it in different ways, remote replication. Now you get into sync and, and, and async. Uh, but, but essentially what I'm hearing you say, Doc, is, is you're squeezing that red area out so, so your customers can sleep at night. That, oh, absolutely, sleep at night is so appropriate. And in fact, we've got a large portion of our customer base is, are, are they're running mission critical businesses. You know, we have some of the, the most mission critical companies in, in, our, in our logo portfolio in, in the world. We also have, by the way, some very significant service provider businesses who are, who are providing you know, mission critical capabilities to their customers in turn, and, and they need to sleep at night. And it, it's, you know, availability is only one factor, certainly manageability is another, because, you know, not meeting a service level is just like data unavailability in some respects. So making manageability as automatic as it can be, making sure that the, that the system is not only self-healing, but can re respond to variations in workload appropriately is very, very critically important as well. Yeah. So that, that you mentioned mission critical workloads. And those are the those are the workloads that let's face it, they're not moving into the cloud, certainly not in any any big way. You know, why would they? Generally our you know, CIOs, CTOs, they're putting a brick wall around that saying, hey, it works. We don't want to migrate that piece. But I want to talk more about how your customers are thinking about workload consolidation and rationalizing their storage portfolios. What are those conversations like? Where do they start? And what are some of the outcomes that you're seeing with your customers? Yeah, I think the funny thing about that point, Dave, is that customers are really starting to think about uh, cloud in an entirely different way. You know, at one point cloud meant public cloud. It meant this entity uh, outside the walls of the data center. And people were starting to use services without realizing that that was another type of cloud. And then they were starting to build their own versions of cloud. You know, we, we were referring to them as private clouds, but they were, you know, really spread beyond the walls of a single data center. So now it's a very hybrid world and there's lots of different ways to look at it. Hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, whatever, you know, moniker you want to put on it. It really comes down to a consistency in how you manage that infrastructure, how you interface with that infrastructure, and then understanding what the practicality is of putting workloads in different places. And practicality means not only the, you know, the latency of access of, of the data, but the costs associated with it. And of course, the other aspects that we talked about, like the, the availability metrics. And, and as you increase the availability and performance metrics, those costs go up. And that's one of the reasons why some of these larger mission critical data centers are, are really, you know, repatriating their, their mission critical workloads at least the highest highest levels of them. And others are looking at other models, for example, AWS Outposts, uh, which you know talked about quite a bit recently in AWS reInvent. Yeah, I just wrote again this weekend that, that you guys were one of the uh, uh, partners 
that was qualified now uh, to run on AWS Outposts. It's interesting as Amazon moves its, you know, this is sort of its, its, its model to the edge, uh, to, to the, which includes the data center to them, they need partners that can, that really understand how to operate in an on-premises world, how to service uh, the, those customers. And, and so that's great to see you guys as part of that. Yeah, thank you. And you know, it was actually a very seamless integration because of the power and capability of all of the different interface models that we have because they all are fully and tightly integrated and, and work seamlessly. So if you want to use a, you know, a, a CSI type model, uh, you know, to interface with your storage, you can uh, with, with Infinidat. And, you know, we work with all of the different flavors. So it, the, the qualification process, the certification process and the documentation process was actually quite easy. And now we're able to provide, you know, people who have particularly larger workloads that capability in the AWS on-premises type environment. Yeah, now I implied up front that, that cloud computing was the you know, main factor, if not the primary factor, really driving some of the changes that we're seeing in the marketplace. Now, of course, it's all not all pink roses with the cloud. We've seen numerous public cloud outages this year, certainly from Microsoft. We saw the AWS Kinesis outage in November. Google just had a major outage this month. Gmail was down, G Suite was down for an extended period of time and that disrupted businesses who rely on that, schools, for example. So it's always caveat emptor as we know, but, but talk to Infinidat's cloud strategy. You mentioned hybrid. I'm particularly interested in, in how you're dealing with things like orchestration and containers and Kubernetes. Yeah, well, of course we have a very feature rich set of interfaces for containers, Kubernetes interfaces, you know, downloadable through native, uh, native stores. So they're, they're very easy to integrate with. You know, but our, our cloud strategy is that, you know, we are a, a software centric model and we, you know, all of the, all of the value and feature function that we, we provide is through the software. The hardware of InfiniBox is really a reference architecture that we, uh, we deliver to make it easier for customers to enjoy say hundred percent availability model. But if, if you want to run something in a traditional on-premises data center, you know, straight InfiniBox is fine, but we also give you the flexibility of cloud-like consumption through our pricing models, our, our elastic pricing models. So you, you don't need to consume an entire InfiniBox day one. You can grow and shrink that environment with, uh, with an OpEx model, or you can um, buy it as you consume it in a, in a CapEx model, and you can switch uh, from OpEx over to CapEx if it becomes more cost effective for you in time, which I think is, is what a lot of people are looking for. If you're looking for that public cloud, we, you know, we have our Nutrix cloud offering, which is now being delivered more through partners. But you know, some businesses, and especially the the mid tier, um, you know, the SMB all the way through the mid enterprise, are also now looking to cloud service providers. Many of which use Infinibox as as their back end. And now with AWS Outposts, of course, you know, we can give you that on premises uh, uh, experience of the public cloud. Yeah, you guys were early on, obviously, in that that subscription based model, and now sort of everyone's doing it. I noticed in the latest. Uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant on on storage arrays, which you guys were named the leader. Uh, they, I think they had a stat in there said that by, I forget what the exact time frame was that 50% of customers would be using that type of model. And I, I guarantee by whatever time frame that was, 100% of the vendor community is going to be delivering that type of model. So, so congratulations on 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 being named a leader. I will say this: there's 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 consolidation happening in the market. So this to me this bodes well. To the extent that you can guarantee high availability and consistent performance uh, at, at scale, that bodes well for, for you guys in a consolidating market. And I know IDC just released a paper, it was called, a, I, got a, I got a copy here, it's called a checklist for uh, storage workload consolidation at petabyte scale. It was written by Eric Bergner, who I've known for a, a number of years. He's, he's the IDC's VP of infrastructure. Uh, he knows his stuff and the paper is very detailed, so I'm not going to go through the checklist items, but I, but I think if you don't mind, Doc, I, I think it's worth reading 
an excerpt from this, if I can, as part of his conclusions. When considering workload consolidation, IT organizations should carefully consider their performance, availability, functionality, and affordability requirements, of course. Few storage systems on the market will be able to cost effectively consolidate different types of workloads with different IO profiles onto a single system, but that is an infinite forte. They're very good at it. So that's, a, that's quite a testimonial. You know, why is that? Your thoughts on what Eric wrote. Well, you know, first of all, thank you for the kudos on the Gartner MQ. You know, being a leader, uh, you know, the second year in a row for primary storage only because that document's only existed for two years. <laughs> but uh, you know, we were also a leader in uh, hybrid storage arrays before that, and and you know, we we love Gartner. We think they're they're you know um, a real critical you know reliable source for a, for a lot of large companies and and IDC. You know, Eric, of course, is uh, he's a name in the industry. So, we, you know, we very much appreciate when he writes something, you know, that positive about us. But to, to answer your question, Dave, you know, there's there's a lot that goes on inside Infinibox and it's the, the neural cache capabilities, the deep learning engine that is able to understand the different types of workloads, how they operate, uh, how to provide, you know, predictable performance. And, and that I think is ultimately key to an application. It's not just high performance, it's, it's predictable performance. It's making sure the application knows what to expect. And, and of course it has to be performant. It can't just be slow, but predictable. It has to be fast and predictable. Providing a, a, a multi-tenant infrastructure that is, that is native to the architecture uh, so that these workloads can coexist, whether they're truly just workloads from multiple applications or workloads from different business units, or potentially, as we mentioned with cloud service providers, workloads from different customers. You know, they, they need to be segmented in such a way so that they can be managed, operated, and provide that performance and availability, you know, at scale, because that's where data centers go. That's where data centers are. Great, well, so we'll bring that graphic back up just to show, obviously this is available on your website. Uh, you can go download this paper from Eric uh, from IDC, www.infinidat.com slash en slash resource. I, I would definitely you know, recommend you check it out. Uh, as I say, Eric's uh, been in the business a long, long time. So, so that's great. Doc, we'll give you the last word. Anything we didn't cover? Any big takeaways you wanna, you wanna share with the audience? Yeah, you know, I think I'll go back to that point. You know, consolidation is absolutely key for uh, not just simplicity of management, but capability for you to respond quickly to changing business requirements and or new business requirements, and also do it in a way that is cost effective. You know, just buying the new shiny object is, is it's, it's expensive and it's very limited in, in shelf life. You're just going to be looking for the next one the next year. You want to provide something that is going to provide you that predictable capability over time. Because frankly, I have never met a CXO of anything that wasn't trying to increase their profit margin. You know, that's a great point. And I just, I would add, I mean, the shiny new object thing, look, if you're in an experimental mode and playing around with, you know, artificial intelligence or automation, thing, you know, areas that you really, don't know a lot about, you know what, check out the shiny new objects. But I would argue your on-prem storage, you don't want to be messing around with that. That's, it's not a shiny new objects business. It's really about, you know, making sure that that base is, is stable and as you say, predictable and, and, and reliable. So Doc Dorico, thanks so much for coming back in the cube. Great to see you. Great to see you, Dave, and look forward to next time. All right, and thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and we'll see you next time on the cube.